Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk um, about uh, short vectors in ideal lattices. Uh, ideal lattices are a particular kind of Euclidean lattices. Um, lat uh, computational problems in Euclidean lattices provide a strong foundation for post-quantum cryptography. And um, essentially, you want to build uh, cryptographic schemes to security rely more or less on the problem of finding short vectors in such Euclidean lattices. How short? Well, um, how short you want the vec to find vectors will uh, um, determine the difficulty of the problem. On any lattice, you have some shortest vectors. These are the hardest to find. If you're uh, interested in finding the shortest vectors of your lattice, you can do it, thanks to the algorithm uh, BKZ. But it will take you exponential time in the dimension of the lattice, is the point here on this graph. But you can make the problem simpler by asking not to find the shortest vectors of your lattice, but some approximate shortest vectors, vectors that are not the shortest, but the shortest up to some approximation factor. And when the approximation factor is large, the problem becomes simpler. In particular, if you're interested in approximation factors that are exponential in the dimension, then you can do this in time uh, polynomial in the dimension, thanks to the algorithm LLL. It's the point at the bottom of this graph. Now, I mentioned ideal lattices. Ideal lattices are um, a particular case of Euclidean lattices. The problem with generic Euclidean lattices is that when you try to design cryptographic schemes based on problems in them, you realize very quickly that um, you're going to end up with uh, a lot of memory and bandwidth uh, requirements. So you can use some lighter alternative uh, lattices with more structures that allow you to build uh, faster algorithms, faster protocols, with lighter in memory and bandwidth. And the typical example of this are uh, cyclotomic ideal lattices. So what are cyclotomic ideal lattices? For the rest of the talk, I'm going to fix an integer m together with a primitive m root of unity omega. So omega is a complex number, which raised to the power m is 1. Uh, I'm defining the field k to be q a joint omega. It's the cyclotomic field of conductor m. It is a number field of degree phi of m, where phi is an Euler-Stotian function. This field k contains a subring, uh, z brackets omega, which I write O, which is the ring of integers of this field. So where are our lattices? Well, k is a number field of degree phi of m. So it embeds into the real vector space of dimension phi of m through what we call Minkowski's embedding. And through this embedding of the field into a vector space, the subring, the ring of integers, be becomes a lattice. So O can be seen as a lattice in this real vector space of dimension phi of m. So here we have our lattice, but in fact we have many more lattices because any ideal in this ring O is also a lattice in that vector space. And these are what we call ideal lattices. So they come with all kinds of additional algebraic structure compared to uh, generic lattices. So they allow to build very interesting protocols, but of course, you have to wonder, does the problem of finding short vectors become simpler? And yes, it does become simpler. It has been proven that you can find shorter vectors more efficiently, at least if you have a quantum computer. Uh, this is uh, the result of a long series of works culminating in Kramer et al. 2017, where it was shown then that in ideal lattices, you can find in quantum polynomial time a sub-exponential approximation of the shortest vector. So you can cut the graph in the middle, and here it's quantum polynomial time. OK, so the object of the paper I'm presenting today is understanding precisely when do these quantum algorithms start outperforming LLL and BKZ? Because these are all asymptotics. It doesn't tell much about what's happening with concrete parameters. So how do these algorithms work? They come essentially in two parts. The first part deals with a particular family of ideals called principal ideals. A principal ideal is an ideal that has a generator, meaning that A is principal if it has uh, a generator G, which is an element such so that A is just G times the ring O. G is called the generator, and instead of looking at the problem of finding short elements in A, you can look at the problem of finding short generators of A. So it sounds like you're making the problem more difficult because now instead of finding a short arbitrary thing, you're asking for a short thing that is also a generator. But it's making the problem somehow simpler by highlighting the relevant algebraic structure. So this is the approach taken in this series of work, starting by, uh, with uh, Campbell et al. in 2014. So how do you do this? You look at the following problem. You're given a principal ideal A, and you look for a short generator of A. How short? Well, uh, this short. You want it to have a norm this quantity, where on the left here you have essentially the length of the shortest vector of the lattice. 
And what remains, of course, is the approximation factor, which in our case is a sub-exponential quantity in the dimension. So you want to find something of that length. How are you going to do this? It's a two-step process. You're given a principal ideal A. You know it has a generator, but you're not given a generator. So the first step is to find one. So find an arbitrary generator. This is already a non-trivial problem, but it can be solved in quantum polynomial time. It's a result of Biasen-Song in 2000, 2016. But this algorithm that finds a generator finds a generator that is usually extremely large. So the second step consists in finding a shorter one. So why would you find an arbitrary one in the first place? Well, if you have a generator, you're in a better position because now you have a search space. You're given an arbitrary generator G of A, so you know that the set of all generators is G times O star, where O star is the subgroup of uh, the group of, of uh, units of your ring. Okay, so you have a, short, uh, a search space. You're looking for a short element in this set here. So the way you're going to try to find a short element in there is by transforming this problem into a lattice problem through what we call the logarithmic embedding. And this is what has been done in Kramer et al. 2016. The logarithmic embedding, so here's the definition. I'm not going to go through it. But what you have to understand is simply that it behaves as you would expect from a logarithmic map in that it transforms a multiplicative structure into additive structure. It takes the multiplicative structure of K star and transforms it into the additive structure of this vector space. In particular, it transforms the group of units O star into a lattice, which we call the logarithmic unit lattice, written log of O star. So if we apply this, this logarithmic map to our problem, what do we get? Remember, we're looking for a short generator of G times O. We know that the set of all generators is G times O star. If we apply the logarithmic embedding map, you are looking for a short element in a translated lattice because the logarithm of g times o star is the logarithm of this element plus this log unit lattice. So now you're looking for a short element in a translated lattice. That can be done by solving an instance of the closest vector problem with respect to this lattice log of o star. So we reduced our problem to a closest vector problem. Um, it's not clear how that helps because the closest vector problem is also a difficult problem, unless you know a lot about your lattice. And here we do know a lot about this lattice. The logarithmic unit lattice has been studied very thoroughly, and we know, in particular, a full rank, of, uh, a full rank set of short vectors in it, which can be used to solve the closest vector problem with sufficient approximation factor. And these, uh, these uh, vectors come from uh, what we call cyclotomic units. So to understand how short is the generator we find, we need to understand how precisely we can actually solve this instance of the closest vector problem. OK, so this is uh, for the part dealing with uh, um, uh, ideals that are principal, so that have a generator. What about the general case? Now, you're supposed uh, you're given an arbitrary ideal. So it's not principal. It doesn't have a generator. You cannot be looking for a short generator. We're going to find a short vector in this ideal. How short? Well, the same quantity with here the length of the shortest vector and here the approximation factor we're trying to reach. And to do this, um, the idea is to reduce again to the principal case. And uh, so what is done in Kramer et al. 2017 is uh, you find a small ideal B such that the product AB is principal. So since B is small, this product AB is in some sense close to A. It's A times something small. And it's principal, so we call AB a close principal multiple. Once you have that, you use the previous part of what I uh, presented, and you find a short generator in this principal ideal AB, and this short generator is also a short vector in A. OK, so how do we find these, uh, principal, this, these uh, close principal multiples? Um, First, you have to transform, again, your problem into a lattice problem. I'm not going to be very precise here, but just to give you a rough idea of what are the main steps, we first need to solve an instance of the discrete logarithm problem in the class group of uh, our ring in order to represent our ideal A as a point in some lattice L. The lattice L represents, uh, the points on the lattice represent some ideals, and we want to find to which point of this lattice A corresponds. We do this with uh, discrete logarithm computation. Once you've done that, you can look at the sublattice of L, which corresponds to principal ideals. So uh, P is a sublattice of L, and it encodes principal ideals. And since we are looking for a close principal ideal to A, it's only natural to try to solve the closest vector problem with respect to this point A as a vector of the lattice L. 
and uh, the sublattice of principal ideal. So you're again reduced to solving an instance of the closest vector problem. You're going to find a vector in P, so a principal ideal that is close to A. And again, you have to wonder, can we solve this closest vector problem? Again, it's supposed to be uh, difficult if you don't know enough about your lattice. Well, it's been shown that you can. You can solve the CVP um, using the Stickelberger theorem, it's a pretty old theorem that allows you to build a good basis of the so-called Stickelberger lattice, which is a sub-lattice of this lattice P encoding principal ideals. And this basis is good enough to allow to solve the closest vector problem with good enough approximation factor. And this is the result of Kerner et al. 2017. And again, to understand how short are the vectors that we find, we need to understand how well we can solve this instance of the closest vector problem. So yeah, how short are the vectors that we find? Uh, I already told you, right? I mean, we find vectors of uh, this Euclidean norm, where here is the shortest vector that could be found. And here is the approximation factor that we're trying to reach. Um, but this is not extremely satisfying. And the reason is simply this big O here. It doesn't, with this big O here, we don't know much about what's actually happening with concrete parameters. Worse than that, the big O is in the exponent, so it has an enormous impact. So we're trying to understand what are the hidden constants in there and try to derive from that when these algorithms start out performing the classic methods LLL and BKZ. So we can try to do that by simulating the algorithm. We run the algorithm and we see how, what, what's the quality of the output, and we compare that to what could have been done with LLL or BKZ. The problem is that these algorithms are quantums and we cannot actually run them. So we need to find a way to simulate them without having a quantum computer. So let's, let's identify the quantum steps. So here's a summary of the algorithm. As I already told you, we start by solving an instance of this discrete logarithm problem in the class group. This should already tell you that you need a quantum computer to do that. The class group is a pretty big group. You don't know much about it. Even computing its structure requires a quantum computer if you want to work in polynomial time. Once you've done that, you need to solve an instance of the closest vector problem in the Stickelberger lattice to find a small vector, a small ideal B such that AB is principal. So here it uh, can be done classically. It's uh, uh, an instance of CVP. And this step is essentially the closest uh, principal multiple problem. Once you've done that, the third step is to find an arbitrary generator of this uh, principal ideal AB. This, again, you need a quantum computer. It might not be as obvious as when you see discrete logarithm, but trust me, to find an arbitrary generator, if you want to do it in polynomial time, uh, you will need your quantum computer. Then finally, uh, to uh, find a short generator, so G is an arbitrary generator, and to find a short one, you need to solve a closest vector problem, this time with respect to the logarithmic unit lattice. And then H is your output. Okay, so we have these two annoying quantum steps. And then to understand how short the output is, you need to understand first how small is this uh, ideal B that you find in step two, and how short is the generator H that you find in step four. So how do we get rid of these quantum steps? Well, we're going to do something very trivial. We just assume that their output is uniformly distributed. Now, that sounds like a really strong assumption, but this can be made rigorous, actually, by just re-randomizing their outputs. Every time you have a quantum step, you take its output, you re-randomize it to make sure it's uniform, you solve the classical step, and then you de-randomize to make sure that you got the correct result. And then we can always assume that the classical steps have an input that is uniformly distributed. Uh, this can be done uh, rigorously, more or less, by studying uh, random walks in the class group, things like this. OK, so we can remove these quantum steps and replace them by uh, random oracles that just give you random outputs. And then see what it, uh, what's happening with the closest vector uh, steps. So we have two CVP instances uh, in step two with respect to the Stickelberger lattice and in step four with respect to the logarithmic unit lattice. These lattices, we know explicit uh, short bases for them. So we can actually experiment with them. We can run numerical simulations, and we can prove theoretical lower bounds. Um, so here are our results. The, uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the dimension of the lattice that you're working on. And on the vertical ac axis, you have a measure of the quality of the output. It's the root hermit factor. It's not exactly the uh, approximation factor. It is essentially the approximation factor raised to the power 1 over the dimension of the lattice. Choosing this root hermit factor allows us to have horizontal lines for the classic algorithms. So here, this line, for instance, written LLL, uh, says that in whatever dimension, you achieve a root hermit factor of about 1.022. 
It doesn't mean that LLL will give you as good of an approximation in any dimension, because remember that this quantity is raised to the power of one over the dimension. Okay. Um, then all the other horizontal lines are BKZ for different block lengths. So uh, the bigger the block length, the costlier the algorithm, but the better the quality of the output. In blue here, you have uh, the results of simulations for a plain implementation of the quantum algorithms. So naive implementation, meaning uh, implemented just as described in the articles, the original articles, without trying to do any kinds of optimizations. And the red lines are uh, the same algorithms, but uh, with a number of heuristic improvements. For instance, instead of just using a short basis of the basis of the lattices we are looking at. We exploit the fact that we don't only know a basis, but we know a very large set of short vectors. The number of short vectors we know in the lattices that we're working with is much larger, larger than the dimension. And we can exploit that using appropriate uh, CVP algorithms. And this is a very worthwhile improvement because as you can see, the red curve is uh, way better than the blue curve. Now here, the uh, brown curve uh, is um, a theoretical limit, a theoretical uh, lower bound on what could be achieved by this family of algorithm, assuming that you have a perfect CVP solver. So uh, these blue and red are actually uh, numerical simulations using state-of-the-art uh, algorithms for solving CVP, and the brown line assumes that you have a perfect solver. So it shouldn't be a, uh, possible to go below these brown lines if we stay within the same realm of uh, algorithms. So uh, the interesting points in these graphs are the crossover points with the classical uh, algorithms. For instance, if you look at uh, BKZ 120 and 160, which are essentially uh, the limit of what's achievable today, 120 is feasible in a few days, 160 is it's probably feasible if you're extremely rich and you have a little bit of time. Um, what we can see is that our heuristically improved algorithm will not give better results than these until dimension about 6,000. For context, uh, I think the largest dimension of a cyclotomic ideal lattice that appears in the NIST competition is about 1,000. So this is an order of magnitude bigger. Uh, and then if you're worried about uh, what could be possible in the future if we have very good CVP solvers, you can look at the brown line, and you can see that uh, it won't cross BKZ 3, 000, uh, 300 until also dimension about 6,000. BKZ 300 is essentially uh, the first security level in the NIST competition. Okay, so these are the references I used. In, uh, I'm done. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Okay, I'll ask one. Can you uh, comment on the difference between the actual instances of ideal SVP that you were studying here and the ones that, and, and the kinds of problems that appear in cryptographic systems? What are the differences? Yeah. So um, in the numerical simulations that I showed here, um, one difference is that we are looking at uh, uh, cyclotomic fields of prime conductor. Whereas usually you would use uh, cyclotomic fields of power of uh, a power of two conductor. The reason we do that is that, so we still study the case of power of two, but uh, it's not this graph. And the reason is that powers of two are way too sparse to get uh, uh, good uh, extrapolations of uh, what you get you get here. Um, what are the differences? I don't know. Well, the dimension is obviously way bigger than what you would actually find in practice in uh, this tale, at least. Uh, well, my question is, are, I, are ideal lattices in cyclotomic number fields actually appearing in proposed crypto systems? Oh, or okay. Which ones? So, uh, yeah, bre breaking ideal SVP wouldn't actually break the crypto systems for many reasons. Uh, first, uh, most crypto systems actually rely on, the problem, on problems that are supposedly stronger, like uh, I, I, I ring LWE or whatever. And, uh, this is just the, the, if you can solve this, it doesn't mean you can break the crypto system because the reduction is only in one direction. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
Any other questions? Okay, let's uh, thank Benjamin again. <laughs>